First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Madam President and the, the Oxford Union for inviting me to participate in this debate, which obviously I'm an outsider to uh, as someone from the United States. I'm not really able to speak to the phrase for queen and country or for king and country in the same way that my friends here in the room uh, who are British can do so. I have a, and I have a very different angle of vision on this proposition. Uh, the way it has been presented, I think, in the debate so far has been that on the one side, we have the idea that uh, some wars are just, some wars are not, some wars are worth fighting, some are not. Therefore, you cannot support the, the proposition uh, because there are some wars that you must be ready to fight. On the other side, uh, the idea that all wars are uh, wrong and for various reasons should not be supported. I have a different way of looking at this proposition. I'm not a pacifist. I've never been a pacifist. I'm a realist. But I'm also a realist who recognizes militarism when I see it. And I would like to present to this uh, honorable gathering the following proposition, that we must view this issue not in the abstract, not as a philosophical issue, but as a question that goes directly to the present day and the issue that is presented by the wars which are being fought today, that are being planned for the immediate future, and which can be anticipated realistically over the coming decade. In other words, I'm suggesting that what is really at stake here in this issue is much greater than simply how we feel about king and country, how we feel about war. This is a matter of realist vision or lack of realist vision about the present situation that we face in terms of war. Now, I uh, look at this issue from the vantage point of somebody who was, uh, who, who was a uh, young man when the Vietnam War began. I had just graduated from college a few months before the first American bombs fell on North Vietnam and the first American Marines splashed ashore at Da Nang. And that, that year from 1964, the, the school year of 1964 to 65, I spent in Washington, D.C. I can tell you that being of draft age powerfully concentrates the mind. And I very quickly became an, an avid student of the background of the Vietnam War. As I watched the United States edge into uh, war in 1965. And so my angle of vision is very much influenced by my understanding of the nature of that war in historical context. That war was the product of American militarism. And of course, it was a militarism that implicated Britain as well because of the special relationship. And I think if we look at the present day, the last decade of wars, we see this pattern, of course, repeated, that American militarism has once again involved Britain in two wars of occupation, in Iraq for eight years, and in Afghanistan for 11 years and counting. And again, I want to make the, the fundamental point that what is at stake here in looking at the question of whether we should be fighting in these wars or supporting these wars is much bigger than simply how we feel about them. The stakes are much greater, much, much more serious than I think the news media and our governments, the British and American governments, have allowed us to know. I think the stakes involve uh, a threat uh, to the American and British people, which in many ways rivals 
or is comparable to the threat from Nazi Germany and fascist Japan during World War II or before <coughs> World War II. I say this because the reasons that these wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were not just utter disasters on the ground in those countries, but much more serious uh, problems for both of our peoples, is that they created an enormous and unprecedented <coughs> backlash of support for Al Qaeda and other Al Qaeda like jihadist organizations throughout the Islamic world. If you go back to the immediate aftermath of the US invasion and occupation of Iraq, we know that immediately thousands of jihadists, many of them newly minted jihadists, streamed across the border from other countries in the Middle East into Iraq and became part of the war against the occupying forces. Now, of course, what happened then was that those jihadists joined the existing Al Qaeda operatives in Iraq. And for the first time, the jihadist movement Al Qaeda, which had no presence, no influence in Iraq, whatever, before the American invasion, became an important political military force in that country. And today, you can still read in the newspapers, Al Qaeda is carrying out bombings, terror bombings against Shia targets in Iraq. The problem is not ended. It is a long-term problem directly created by the American War of Occupation. Now, within a matter of months after that American invasion, the director of the CIA, George Tenet, announced dramatically that Al Qaeda had metastasized into dozens of jihadist organizations around the world, which he called the next wave of the terror threat. And within two years after that uh, statement by George Tenet, the US intelligence community issued a national intelligence estimate, which stated that the war in Iraq had caused the people in the Islamic world, because of their opposition, their fear, and their loathing of the American role in Iraq to uh, support jihadism much more strongly, that it was now a much greater threat, and that throughout the Islamic world there was an upsurge of support for uh, anti-American jihadism. And the former uh, s uh, director of the CIA's Counterterrorism Center uh, declared in 2007 that what had happened was that many people in the Islamic world had uh, become so upset, so frightened, and so upset by the American role in uh, Iraq that they had indeed become sympathetic to jihadism. So, what we're looking at here is, a, again, an unprecedented problem uh, that faces both of our people, which is the product of militarism, uh, of a system of militarism. And, and I want to say that I agree very strongly with one of the uh, student uh, speakers uh, this evening who mentioned the, the fact that, that this is not a matter of simply being able to choose from column A or from column B the war that you want to support or the war that you want to fight in. It doesn't work that way. We're talking about the way in which a war system operates. What we're looking at, particularly in the United States, is a system of militarism, which began during the Cold War, was uh, obviously uh, seen during the Vietnam era, was in something of retreat after Vietnam, but then after the end of the Cold War, was resurgent, and particularly after 9-11, you see a new and more virulent phase of American militarism. So what we're up against right now is a system which is planning wars uh, which will not have the same heavy footprint as Iraq and Afghanistan, true, at least it's very unlikely in the coming decade that that will happen, but wars which uh, depend on drone strikes which depend on special operations forces, 
going in and conducting night raids to pick out people that they believe are uh, the enemy. Now, I would just point out two things about the kinds of wars which are now planned already. And of course, in Pakistan and Yemen and uh, in Somalia, we've already had these kinds of, of wars with a lesser footprint being fought. These wars are very problematic for two reasons. First of all, there's a great illusion that the CIA has promoted and the White House has promoted that the United States uh, drone strikes can pick out uh, target uh, specific individuals, high-ranking Al-Qaeda uh, officials supposedly, and do so without uh, killing a lot of civilians. Well, I've, I've studied the drone war in, in Pakistan very carefully, and I can tell you that uh, it simply doesn't work that way. The first four years of the drone war in Pakistan, there were 150 civilians killed according to the press accounts of these strikes and only 40 people who could be vaguely described as militants. <coughs> the second illusion about this kind of war is that every time you start a new war with drones, you have a clean slate that the people in that country are going to uh, think, well, it's just the Americans doing what they need to do and we'll see what happens. No, that's not the way it works. There's a cumulative effect of the wars of occupation in Iraq and Afghanistan, which then affects the way in which the Pakistanis, the Yemenis, the Somalis view what is going on in their country, as well as understanding that it is not the pristine, clean war that it's being claimed to be. And so in conclusion, what I would like to leave you with is the thought that we are faced with an unprecedented threat that is not theoretical, it's not a matter of our preferences, it's not a matter of our, simply our values. We need to recognize the reality that stares us in the face, and that reality calls for a, a, state, a statement of saying no to the wars that we know are already being fought or are going to be fought in the near future. Thank you very much.